All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Robert Smith, and it's a pleasure to be here today with all of you. Uh, this session has been sold out for weeks, and we're excited about that. And I'll tell you what's interesting is today, we came to Davos three days ago with the, with the intent to understand this fundamental change in the business economy, this new world order of the Internet of Things, and understand this technological revolution that has the potential to change the way we work, how we relate to each other, grow food, manage and care for our elderly, repair the planet. In the first couple of days, we were hijacked. We were hijacked by a massive sell-off in the equity markets, by debt markets that seemed to evaporate, by commodity pricing that, that seemed to have no bottom, and a slowdown in markets we thought would continue to grow forever. But what we have now done is now get back to the reason that we are here is to understand this technological revolution we are now calling the fourth industrial uh, revolution. The interesting things about this are that there are components that are changing, there are systems that are changing, there are dynamics that are affecting every single business on the planet, every industry, every country, and frankly, every human being on the planet in one way, shape, or another. And what we have to do as leaders in this industry is to figure out ways that we will guide this to make it work so that we can become a better society, a more effective manager of businesses, and not end up where technology takes us, but drive it to the right places. So today, I'm actually quite privileged to be here with a very distinguished panel to talk about the impact that they are seeing on this fourth industrial re revolution through the eyes of the components, through the customers, and the partners. We term this the Internet of Things. Well, as a good friend of mine, John Chambers, and I like to now call it the Internet of Everything. Everything is connected. Devices, networks, people. And what we have to do is manage through this in an effective manner. So what we need to do today is first introduce my distinguished panel. First, I have Mike Gregoire. And Mike is a 25-year veteran in the software industry, is now the leader of CA Technologies. And Mike is going to talk a bit about his perspectives on cybersecurity, how it's evolving, how he is helping his customers embrace the opportunity that is his fourth industrial revolution. I also have the good chance to uh, introduce Mike McNamara, who's the CEO of Flex. Flex is one of the main partners in this Internet of Everything uh, revolution, helping customers think about design, come up with componentry, systems designs, and understand how that works as a true partner in the context of pushing their products and systems and solutions into, mar into the marketplace. Andreas Ratopoulos. I got it, right, Andreas? You got it. <laughs> Andreas is one of those wonderful inventors who is also a disruptor, who is also becoming part of this internet of everything. Andreas has come up with a wonderful business, uh, MatterNet, that actually is going to solve some of the problems of last mile delivery. Do it in an effective and efficient manner, but also to the, to the threat of the incumbents disrupt potentially a half trillion dollar industry. And we have TK Curian. TK runs one of the largest software technology outsourcing and consulting businesses called Wepro. About $8 billion in revenues, serves over 175 different industries, and I think close to 200,000 employees. He has become a trusted partner in this evolution, in this industrial revolution. And so TK's, TK is going to talk about what he sees and what he has encountered with the customers and how he can help them and what their challenges are. So with that, let me just first give a little bit of a, a, a level set. First of all, what is this Internet of Everything, the Internet of Things? It is the connectivity of devices and sensors that ultimately in a, a fabric of software analytics and technology give us the ability to understand our world better, shape outcomes, determine and predict what it is that we'd like to have happen and actually drive resources toward them. It is an industry that first was estimated at $6 trillion and then 11 trillion. Cisco estimated 50 billion devices being installed by 2020. I heard a recent estimate by a very credible source in the industry saying 1 trillion devices by 2025. I had the good fortune to meet with uh, an, an executive who builds housing in, in Germany and in, and, in, uh, in, and in Amsterdam recently who said in one building they have over 60 thousand devices. So now start to do the math. It becomes big. It becomes enormous. And it becomes important for us to understand how we, as a society, as business leaders, are going to manage this effectively. 
So I'm gonna turn my first question to Mike Gregoire. Mike, you've been at this for 25 years. You've seen massive uh, uh, changes in the software industry. Tell us a little bit about what your customers are encountering and how you and your company are looking to shape exactly the, the proper outcomes, the right outcomes for them as customers, but also how do you ensure that they are thoughtful about what resources they put against embracing the opportunity? Well, I think just about everybody has understood that we've become an application economy. And as they start thinking about their own business models and how they relate to their own customers, it's really coming to being through an app. And in the process of doing that, the way that we've built applications you know, for the last 40 or 50 years has been this waterfall methodology, very serially done, but it takes too long. And with our economies moving as quickly as we can, we need to do something much, much faster. So the methodology that just about everybody's adopted is Agile, which is a completely different cultural change, which means you don't have um, groups standing by themselves uh, doing a piece of work and handing it off to the next group. You do it together, which means you do iterative development, you fail fast, you have customer input immediately, and this whole new way of thinking is permeating outside of just software development. As they sought work for software development, they said, why don't we run our company this way? And so you're seeing this whole hierarchy in the, in the evolution of a more principle-centered leadership rather than a command and control type of leadership. And unwinding you know, 50 to 60 years of management training where I'm the boss, you do what I tell you to do, rather than you are empowered to do the right thing is a big cultural change. And most of the CEOs I talk to, we start out talking about software, mm -hmm. we always end up talking about culture. Right. Right, great. So let me turn to Mike. So Mike McNamara, one of the things, Mike, you and I have talked about is to what extent CEOs in multiple industries, and you have a chance to, to operate in your business with, with industries from, from, from white goods manufacturing to you know, high tech, what is it that they are facing? What are the challenges they have? And, and in your mind, what do they need to now embrace in order to be effective to compete in the next 20 and 30 years as we evolve this, this, this revolution? Yeah. Yeah, let me, let me just you know, first give you a little context. Um, we have like 10 different industries that we have over a billion dollars of revenue. So within each of those 10, we probably have 50 different customers in each one. So we get this huge perspective both with inside an industry and across industries of what are the new developments what are the new technologies and what are the things uh, people are working on? What do they need to be successful? And, and without doubt, the world has changed. So the world has become faster. It's get, become more complicated. It's become more distributed. Um, demand patterns are becoming, you know, driving into emerging markets. And it's creating a very fast environment. And what, what that is doing then, it's challenging um, companies about how do they get their, get their products to market faster. They have, more disrupt, they have more disruptive companies coming at them. They have more international competition. So what is, you know, between that and um, really taking um, and thinking about this system economy, this app-driven economy, to be successful today, you need not only these sensors and in the field, but you also need content and analytics and, and applications and new business models as a result drive off of a system that you have to produce. So between this faster economy and this system you have to produce, you need a you need a, a go to market uh, strategy that's a little bit different. And what we're seeing is a lot of companies coming to us and just in, and really built around collaboration. Um, and when I say collaboration, it's just how do I get to marketplace faster? You know, right. the wash machine that needs to be connected now. If you want to start from scratch with your mechanical engineers about who studied how to exhaust wash machines, and now all of a sudden you want to connect it to the internet, it's a whole different technology. Right. And that technology may be the same kind of technology that's applicable in many different industries. You know, it's got a wireless module. You have to figure out how to power it. What's the user interface? You have to talk to it. You have to swipe at it. So to be successful in this faster, quicker economy where demand is more distributed and there's more complexity to be successful, you have to find partners who you can co-collaborate co with right. to, in order to get the speed and the, the effectiveness that you need. Good. I want to come back to the partnership thing when we talk with, with TK because a big part of what you're talking about and also what I heard you talking about, Mike, is trust. Mm -hmm. And how is that trust now going to be changed? How does it change and how do we extend it outside of the enterprise? Let me shift it. I'm going to come back to that in a second. Let me shift to Andreas. Andreas, you saw an opportunity and decided, let me, let me go after that opportunity because there is a network in place. There is a, a fabric on which you can build a new business, a new business model. It would be helpful to us to understand you know, what your mindset was going into it and what challenges that you currently face in order for that business model to materialize. 
Um, yeah, so I run a company called, uh, called Martinet. We are a startup in Silicon Valley. Uh, we build um, uh, autonomous aerial vehicles, what most people call drones, uh, to transport uh, lightweight goods between um, uh, places over local areas usually. Um, and um, the driver for us to start uh, this was the realization that the way that the world is going, we will need to solve mobility, especially logistics of goods in a different way. So we made two key realizations. The first was that if you look at the world, at the world today, uh, close to one billion people do not have access to all season roads. Mm -hmm. And it's unreasonable to expect that we have to wait for five decades for the investments in road infrastructure to be put in place for um, these billion people to have access to medicine, diagnostics, and so forth. And then you shift on the other end of the spectrum, our cities and megacities, half of the Earth's population already lives in cities now, and all megacities have transportation infrastructure, but it's very dysfunctional. So, you know, the idea that we had was, is it possible to create a new system to move things around? Um, they call us the Internet of Flying Things. Mm -hmm. And um, we looked at the tools that we have available. And um, uh, feeding off the revolution in mobile computing, there's now very cheap sensors and very reliable sensors that you can use to have a vehicle to self-navigate. And then it really becomes interesting when you start thinking of those, net, of those systems as networks. Right. So um, I see an amazing opportunity here. Um, imagine like uh, you, know, you take any city environment and you're able to lift all that traffic off the road by having these intelligent agents that talk to each other and talk to a central cloud system um, on how to uh, reliably move things around in the city. Um, and for me, this is a much more natural way to solve the problem. It reminds me much more of a flock of birds. Um, you know, it's, it's much more similar to that than, you know, any sort of mechanical system. Okay. And that fluidity of communication and, you know, there's one vehicle that is finding rough weather and it reports that to the system so the next vehicle doesn't, you know, make the same mistake or it learns. Right. This is where the excitement uh, is. And um, uh, I see tremendous opportunities, not just for us, but for everybody that is adopting a mindset of let's build something with the new tools. Right. What I want to do is come back to you and talk a little bit about the challenges you face in the regulatory environment and how do we ensure that your drones aren't are taking down you know, aircraft, causing privacy issues, all those sorts of things. Those are things we want to talk about. That's what we're concerned about. But let me turn to TK. TK, you have a global business. You advise hundreds, if not hundreds of thousands of companies on how they need to move their business models forward. Tell us a little bit about what you're encountering in that market. Tell us a little bit about what the established businesses, what are those CEOs and executives are facing and how, to what extent, you advise them and work with them in, in, in transforming their businesses. Thank you. Maybe I should just give you a two-minute perspective of what's happening in the space itself. Because in many cases, what's happened is that with IoT, everybody has fallen in love with the word and the technology behind it without really understanding on how it's fundamentally shaking up everything from design to aftermarket value. So if you'll go back 10 years ago, if you had to introduce a product into the market, you went out there, did market research, you figured out what customers wanted, you built a product over a, say, year or two years, and you shipped it out. When the product was shipped out, you found that you, would, you, would be, you were able to get premium pricing, and then it went into a commoditization cycle. And then very soon, the value that you created out of design vanished. Mm -hmm. Then what you did was that you went to the market, you sold after-sales service, you made 10% you know, of the value after that. If you're a software company, you made a little more. <coughs> but that's how you derived value. With technology changing and with IoT becoming a reality, fundamentally what's happened is you have smart materials combined with smart communication. Mm -hmm and a software layer that sits between that's able to manage that. So today, when you design a product, you design a mechanical product that will stay for maybe 10 years. But everything else behind it in terms of how you upgrade the product, how you do features in the product, is all driven by software. Right. On the aftermarket side, the biggest opportunity is not just in collecting money off AMC, it's creating a network of shared, uh, shall I say, uh, hosts or people who are your allies who can sit down and make money off your product and you can make money off theirs. A classic example would be the iPhone. Right. Because when you have an app there, every person who writes an app makes money out of it. And the phone itself you can upgrade with over-the-air upgrades. So the phone itself, a basic phone, when you move from iOS 8 to iOS 9, 
You've changed the features. <coughs> so fundamentally, from the same product, you're able to derive value. Very, very few companies in the world are actually thinking this way. They still believe that IoT is about connectivity, right. about solving things like you know, logistics networks, having something on your hand that tells you your blood pressure. That's all fabulous. But if companies that are basically in design, if they don't think through this completely right. and rewire their engineers to think this way, fundamentally, I believe what will end up happening is that we'll have a connectivity revolution, but we won't have a real IoT or we won't see the one law that determines networks in today's age in terms of monetization, which is Metcalf's law, actually taking effect. Yeah, that's, great. that's the biggest thing. Yeah. Because if you look at Facebook, you look at anybody in social media, the way they make money out of that is fundamentally Metcalf's law. Right. Metcalf's law determines value. Right. And that's what you're now going to start getting into physical stuff. Great. And, and let me turn to Michael. You and I have actually talked about this. When you think about a number of the customers that you've gone kind of end to end, helping enable them to embrace you know, this, this, this infrastructure, uh, the mindset, the opportunity to bring in partners and develop what I'll call platforms of development on which you can create multiple streams of revenue, I think it would be helpful to talk about you know, some of your work with some of your customers and what you've been able to accomplish in that context. Well. You know, most of them are trying to build software. I mean, and I'll use uh, one that's been in the paper most recently is GE. Mm -hmm. You know, what a bold statement for GE to say, we want to be one of the biggest software companies or the top 10 software company. And here's the punchline by 2020. Right. That's how fast this is moving. And they are a complete agile shop. If you walk into one of their development centers, you'll find expert software developers working in conjunction with Internet of Things, that's how they're monetizing it, and they're changing a whole conglomerate of a company around a single theme, is that applications are incredibly important. And we're going to see more and more companies really brush up against that business model because you can change it very quickly. You know, it's hard to change a jet engine, right. it's hard to monetize a jet engine, charging on the service because you've got software that understands exactly what that jet engine is doing all day, every day, and you can change your business model as the jet engine ages, you can change the business model as, that, as right. the new features come out. It's just a new way of thinking through doing the same thing they did before, but much, much better, all enabled through software. And at a speed that is unprecedented in terms of the adoption rates. The, but part of that speed and how they get there is through partners. I mean, typically you can't do it themselves. GE has to do it with partners, if it's CA and its other partners. Tell us a little bit about how those partnerships evolve and, and to what level the trust then has to, has to now become much more of a fundamental part of that relationship. Well, I think it, you know, in today's day and age, it's so competitive, especially in software that you have to establish your product has got to be absolutely better than everybody else's. And if you aren't dedicating yourself to continuously improving your own product, you'll be left to, to the side. And what you need to do is ensure a, you know, your customer that you're investing. Our business, for whatever reason, got built where somebody traded a tape for a fixed amount of dollars and then said, eh, I just give me like 25 to 30% every year and I'll, I'll give you the fixes. Yeah. That business model got established. Our industry was really- Bell Labs really, came up with that first, 35 was years ago. Absolutely was, was, but that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. Well, let's, let's thank them or hate them for it. <laughs> but the reality of the matter is, is our industry hasn't been really good about giving value for that you know, 25% every year. Right. And customers are, are pretty adamant now, what am I getting for it? They want to get more software. They want to get upgrades. They want to get these fixed. They want to make sure that the quality is right, that it's continuing to solve their problems, but they're not looking for incremental innovation. Their businesses are changing exponentially. You know, we have a great startup guy here. We can, we can ask him. Big companies are trying to compete with startups, and they can't do it incrementally because right. startups don't go incremental. Right. They go for it all you got it. with a great idea. You got it. Mike, I want to hear from you. You know, you, your business, you work with, again, thousands of companies uh, in, 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 in the design cycle often. Mm -hmm. tell, tell us a little bit about how the design cycle has actually changed and the pace of design. And to a great extent, I'm still focused on this, this what I call this trust factor, because right. if we don't get that right, uh, then you know, all of this you know, collapses yeah. ultimately. I, I want to hear more about the trust factor and then ultimately the security elements associated with it. Yeah, I think you know, I'm going to pick up a little bit of what TK said earlier, because what he described is a different kind of system. You know, you talked about the Internet of Things or the Internet of Everything, because everything is right. going to be connected. But what he described is more than that. And what we actually call it is the intelligence of things. So what is new and different and fundamentally different is the end nodes of everything 
are now connected. And as a result of being connected, or are smart. Great. And as a result of being smart, they're capturing real-time data in the field, which gives us new source of analytics of data and what we can do with that data. And the disruptive business model is built around a whole partnership system that takes that data and turns it into being predictive, it turns it into being analytical and even cognitive. You know, you take the wearables that TK mentioned, it's not just about getting your reading, it's about getting your reading, but then it's also about getting early warning signs of something might be wrong, and then it's also taking it to the next level, which is, um, you know, benchmarking that against other data that looks sure. like this that might lead to a particular problem and a recommendation to do something different. Right. So it's it's the intelligence of things that actually actually is creating the, dis, the disruptive business model. So what it means is the trust with companies has to change. A lot of times the value in products today is not in the hardware, it's in the software, the content, the data, and the predictive and cognitive new business model as a result of it. Right. So. A lot of times companies come to a company like Flex to actually do the hardware for them because a lot of times the hardware is just a vehicle to get to where the real value is created, right. which is in the data. Right. And a lot of times the data, you need a partner system to go make that happen. So when people think about competing in a faster, quicker, more dynamic world, there's more disruption, there's more international competition, there's more technology at unbelievably low cost that actually enables the disruption, you know, the cloud, the smartphone, those things you have to have a different approach towards customers. And you know, kind of a long answer to get back to your trust. Yeah. But you have to have a partnership community to help monetize your data assets. You need a partnership right. community to help you get that hardware out in the field quicker and faster. And, and so companies have to think differently that the world is the, the playground. And if I think about incumbents, um, as opposed to startups, you know, it's always, you know, people are fascinated with startups, no offense there. Yeah. But you know, the incumbents actually have the channel and they have the know-how to do a lot of products. And if they can find, find ways to pivot and use the world as their play, playground so they can go faster, rather than just trying to do everything themselves, they're gonna be more effective uh, moving into this digital area. Right, so what we're doing is we are evolving from what I call a component-based thought process to a systemic thought process. Mm -hmm. That's the real definition or differentiation that this audience, this panel is now bringing forward. Here's what's interesting and here's what's challenging to me. I think about it, I have the good fortune of being in a wonderful software business and, and one of the issues that we always tackle is cybersecurity. Now I think we've done a pretty good job. Like all things, you never win, you can only tie at the server level, the PC level. Ultimately though, it's at the application, the device level. Andreas, I love your business, I worry about your, your, your product in that respect. I wanna hear what are the issues you face, how do you think about it, how do we make sure that you know, your, your devices aren't hijacked like other vehicles that we've seen hijacked on, on, on videos over the last few years. Tell us a little bit about how you think about it. Tell us a little bit about how the regulatory framework is starting to shape your thinking about protecting us from devices that seem to be you know, on their own and controlled by an algorithm. Uh, well, that's a loaded question. So um, it's my job is to load the questions. <laughs> I, I was in a I, I was in a uh, security workshop um, in Silicon Valley a few weeks ago, and um, uh, the question was posed: Is there such a thing as a secure system? And the answer was no. Right. Um, so I think we have to learn how to incrementally uh, make our systems more secure, and we have to go through these learnings in a way that is safe. Uh, and I think that's a general sort of, as we uh, give access uh, to uh, devices around us, anywhere from like a house thermostat to uh, you know, a flying object, right. we have to figure out how do we uh, make sure that they cannot be easily hijacked. Um, and then I think it's gonna be probably a, um, uh, we have to go through a, a learning curve to understand how to uh, really make them robust. But we've seen that happening in computing, right? right? Uh, so we have something to go off from. Do you think we're six months away, a year away, two years away from having real solutions and protection where, where we can feel confident that devices like yours aren't going to endanger the population? Uh, so uh, this is a completely now different question, right? Because the, uh, the focus on the things that we build is how do you make sure that you don't endanger other, uh, other uh, airplanes and you know, how, how you, you do not clash with air traffic. Right. And then how do you don't put uh, people in danger? And uh, we have solutions for that stuff already. So, you know, there is um, a redundant systems on our vehicles that make sure that uh, we never cross into airspace we shouldn't be. So, you know, all the uh, vehicles that we fly will only fly in the lower part of the airspace that's mm -hmm. well segregated 
from any airspace that is occupied by uh, big aircraft carriers, and we are very strong in that segregation. Um, and then there's other sort of um, uh, work that is happening uh, with NASA and others, um, where we participate with people like Google, Amazon, and a bunch of other players to really figure out how uh, a collaborative um, model of the airspace at, the low, at this lower um, uh, segment of the airspace will work. Um, then on the other side of how do you make sure that the machine is safe when it's flying above somebody's home, um, we have very good ways to do that uh, today. And I think the key is in uh, Mike's insight before, right? I mean, we watch that device um, every second. We upload something 100 parameters per, you know, per second, right? right? It all goes up to our uh, cloud system, and we analyze that uh, data in real time. There's other low-level autonomy systems on the vehicles that um, if something wrong is happening, they will pick it up. Um, our vehicles, for instance, just to give you a very tangible example, there's like a watchdog on the vehicle. If something goes off, it loses control authority because of wind, for instance. Um, it will shut its motors off and will deploy a parachute. It will fall beautifully. It will delight all children around it. Right. Um, so you know, there, there's, there's ways in which you can build um, uh, mechanical redundancy into mechanical systems to make sure that your um, risks, uh, you de-risk some of these risks on the, uh, on the other side, the digital side. Okay. I've got two questions for you, TK. The first I want to talk about, the way I think about this market, you know, you obviously have what I call our, our, consu our, our consumer market. We've got a government market, and then we call, you know, business. You know, you have the, the, I think, the great fortune of mainly across all three. You know, the, the, the business market and the industrial market is typically, you know, viewed as three to four times the, the government market. But I want to hear a little bit about, in, in your experience, where do you see governments, where are they doing it right, where are they failing, and what are some of the challenges uh, that, that they face in order to be effective? And what are the shortfalls in the, in the infrastructure today that we all need to be aware of and cognizant of? So what I'll do is I'll address that question in a fairly broad way. Last time I made a comment on the governments, I nearly got lynched. No. Oh. So I'll <laughs> you don't want that to happen. <laughs> I'll stay out of that region. But I'll no just one's give tell you a, here. I'll give you a broad idea of what we're seeing. I think the biggest area of focus right now is the business market. Clearly, that's where the opportunity is. And in that market, a lot of people are trying to kind of go back into their own engineering shops and trying to get the concept of platform thinking kind of inculcated. Mm -hmm. Because if you have a bunch of engineers who've sat and designed products which are unique, you know, if I'm an engineer, I've got to do it my way, and if you're an engineer, you've got to do it your way. If that's the mindset, that mindset has got to be broken now. Once you start thinking platform, you think about standardized hardware, and then you look at software and say, how do I differentiate with software? Mm -hmm. So that the engineering teams are able to do fairly well. Now, I think a large part of the organizations have made the transition. Where, it kind of, where it's kind of getting a little lost is in getting the ecosystem onto the platform. Mm -hmm. So that typically, today in most organizations, does not sit with the engineering function. That sits with the marketing function or the product management function. And the way they see it is it's a transitory kind of a partnership approach. Right. which is that, you know, I like you today, you're a partner, tomorrow I don't get business, off you go. That you cannot have in this environment because you need to have a partner in. The partner has got to make money out of you and you've got to make money out of the partner. Yeah. So the choice of the partner and the trust that you put in a partner is very critical when you get into the business market because you cannot switch today, you can't switch on the fly. You might be able to for the commoditized side of the business, but you can't do it on things that are core. Right. So that's the area that we're seeing big opportunity, and mm -hmm. we're seeing clear opportunity in a couple of areas, logistics being one of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other area that we're seeing, but the biggest thing in logistics is that across the world, we don't get uniformity of data, simply because a large part of the world, in spite of whatever we hear, is still not connected. Right. Right. And uh, the connections are poor. So for example, we recently did uh, one interesting project with an earth-moving company. And we said we're going to kind of, the machine is going to upload data every, I think, couple of milliseconds. Funnily enough, the network drops. There's nothing you can do about it, because right. in between you have these big, dead right. zones of data. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so we've had to go back and redesign to make sure that when we drop, we are able to kind of store the information and then dump it back when the network comes back. Right. But that doesn't give you any kind of sense of real time mm -hmm. in terms of managing data and managing the effectiveness of the machine. Right. But it'll get there. But mm -hmm. I think that's the first big constraint. 
The second big constraint that we see today is the value chain, that is the partnership structure, in many cases is done by the firm themselves. Mm -hmm. We have had to step in and help them with partnerships now. Mm -hmm. So that's the second role that we've had to play. Okay. Right. That's in the business market. I still see big opportunity in that space. Yeah. And it's evolving in the next couple of years. I see this exploding. Right. In the consumer market, we see some wonderful solutions already around security, around energy management, around lighting. And all this combined together, you're going to see a new set of competition coming in. In fact, yesterday I was with one of my customers who's in the lighting business. And he's getting into the security business. Mm -hmm. He's getting, I mean, and it's quite surprising. Right. He's getting into the space management business mm -hmm. because he can see if you have an LED sitting out there, he can see who's sitting where and he can man optimize space. Right. So there are, uh, there are adjacencies which are coming up which we never really <laughs> thought were possible from a conventional player. Yeah. So if you went out there and asked a lighting manufacturer, what do you do best? He would say, I make lights. Now, the guy's doing a whole bunch of things, right. and he's, he's creating a different competitive field. I think that's where the opportunity is coming. Let, let me throw this question out to anyone who wants to, 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 to field it. You know, one of the, the interesting dynamics about this market is the massive productivity uh, when you understand it that can actually be realized by industry or by a company within an industry. Uh, it is, it, it's become somewhat obvious to me. I don't see many governments who actually understand that level of productivity, let alone uh, can, can capture it or, or, or to some degree quantify it. So I, I'm curious to hear if you've had any of those experiences that, that won't get you lynched that you can describe and so we have a better understanding of it. I'll talk about a, uh, a couple positive ones. I'll, I'll talk about the most recent one. Um, about 12 CEOs were invited to the Pentagon with uh, Ashton Carter to compare notes on security. We show up there the night before, we have this lovely dinner, mm -hmm. and we all go back to our respective hotel rooms. This could be an all-day think tank session. I wake up in the morning, get a cup of coffee, and that's the day that Russia um, goes and bombs uh, Syria. I said, well, I guess this is done. I mean, there's no way. If Secretary of Defense of the United States is going to be tied up. We all show up there. Secretary of Defense Ashton Carter stayed all day, never left. Mm -hmm. And he was absolutely looking for how does business handle security and how can we learn and how can he share what he's learned in security that would be apl applicable to business. It was absolutely fascinating. He had all of his direct reports there and they were absolutely moving towards a more collaborative view, uh, kind of like what we talked about when you, when you started the question. Right. So I've seen that happen. Similarly, uh, in the UK, the um, head of uh, the CIO of the UK with respect to their version of the IRS, right. same thing. You know, we, my budget's going down. I have to find ways of being more productive. And this is, a, this is the revenue generating machine of our country. Um, although my budget's gone down, I've got to find out ways to doing things better. So I've seen more collaboration. And, and they want to bump into this whole idea and not get left behind with, the, with respect to the you know, fourth industrial revolution. Right, right. TK, you had some points on that? So a couple of things. I've seen some governments which are way ahead of everybody else. I mean, a classic example would be Singapore. Mm -hmm. Singapore, about, uh, about eight or 10 years ago, came up with an open data standard on how people can collect information and publish that information out to third parties. So government information today is published. For example, traffic information is published. And uh, you can, if you want to write, write apps on top of that, you very well can. Okay. Now, in other governments across the world, we found a significant level of interest at the top level. Everybody's interested to figure out how they can collaborate with the private sector to make things happen. Mm -hmm. The issue that happens is that once you go down the layers and once you give an idea, which may be your idea, suddenly what happens is that you have a request for a proposal that comes in. Right. And what was your intellectual property is now no, out to bid with 50 right. other people right. and right. broken down into components where everyone can understand. <laughs> right. right. So that's where the challenge comes in. Mm -hmm. So the government procurement process has to fundamentally change to kind of see whether they can bring in people who can do experiments. We don't want that forever. But if you can have that for a certain limited period of time, mm -hmm. we're happy to kind of contribute from an intellectual perspective. Right. And I think that's the challenge. But uh, having said that, you know, the funny thing about governments are, no government in the world can stop change. Right. They can resist for some time, but they can't stop change. So it's going to happen. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, please, Andres, yeah. I think the, uh, the 
in order to figure out how, uh, you know, what's going to be successful in this new environment, there need to be a lot of experiments. And the best way to conduct those experiments is to have a very vibrant entrepreneurial um, ecosystem. Great. I think the governments that get this, that really understand how they can cultivate that ecosystem, are the governments that are going to win. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you one of the things I'd, I'd want to spend a little more time, if you, if you don't mind. I mean, your business is, is to me, fascinating. I think you can actually actually go through and look at it and say, wow, the productivity gains in last mile delivery, urban centers globally, you know, you and I talked about a half a trillion dollars. I think it's multiples of that, but that's a, a different conversation. You know, how, how do you, you know, can convince, in, in, you know, not only in investors, but, you know, your, your, your team to say, listen, you know, this is an area we need to focus on here and then ultimately, the, you know, the, the regulators, because that's one of the challenges you have, that this is a worthy pursuit. I'm just curious about the dialogue that you go through, the regulatory environment that you, that you face, because you are truly changing the paradigm in an industry, and we need to understand how to communicate to the regulatory agencies a little more effectively about what the productivity gains are in that context. Yes, I think as, as the, um, it is frequently said by founders, if you foresaw the obstacles uh, at the time of inception, you probably <laughs> right, wouldn't have wouldn't started. It, right? Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think that's the case only here. I mean, it starts from a place of passion where you really want to contribute something. Um, and then you somehow sort of bring in all the uh, emotional, intellectual, and then sort of monetary resources to make it happen. And then if that's the DNA of the company, which is to really create something that can change the world and, you know, uh, can, can really have significant impact, positive impact to society, uh, that is then the DNA of the team and the DNA of the company. And that's how we operated so far. Uh, so um, I think that, um, I mean, I don't know how, how else one can operate. Yeah. Um, it's really, really tough to make something work um, in, uh, you know, that really changes the world because that, that means disruption and disruption is not, you know, there's, there's a lot of, um, uh, of agents that are trying to stop that, right? right. Um, what is extremely interesting now is that like, we started in 2011 mm -hmm. and uh, people thought we were like completely crazy, insane crazy, mm -hmm. um, you know, to be talking about this and, uh, you know, we, we were talking about like taking um, uh, technology that is not proven yet and put it to a place uh, where it can really solve a huge problem in the developing world, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that was a paradigm that is generally, um, you know, not, not right often. Um, and um, what, what was like completely unpredictable uh, to me, and you know, I, I signed up for this like on a 10-year ten, ten horizon, and I thought, you know, if in 10 years we get like to see meaningful deployments of this, then we're successful. Two years into the project, Amazon and Google um, announced their own initiatives exactly on the same path. Right. So then we went from a place of like um, one type of insanity, what are you doing, nobody will believe in this, to another type of insanity, what are you doing in the same space with Amazon and Google, right? Um, but um, the, the great thing is that, you know, it's, uh, the ecosystem is now there. Uh, everybody gets it. So um, I know that all major uh, logistics companies are thinking about this. Uh, how are they going to develop technology or partner with other people that develop technology? Mm -hmm. um, companies that are disrupting mobility are thinking about this, right? right? right. And they're thinking, how can we get into logistics? And because we don't have all this baggage of how do we deal with like the legacy systems? Uh, we'll be something from scratch, and we can adopt new technology. Right. Um, so you know, it's it's a very exciting uh, time, I think. Well, um, before we get to questions, Mike, I might have another question for you. You know, one of the things you and I have discussed is kind of I call it this culture, this mindset of change. And one of the, the di dynamics that, that Davos has, has serviced in, in my mind mm -hmm. is making sure there's a communication to the labor force mm -hmm. that you are part of this transformation, this industrial revolution, this fourth industrial revolution. You know, tell us and give us some of your experiences and companies who have done that well and, and to the extent some companies they haven't, you don't have to give the name, but where they haven't. But I think that's an important part of where we are going to, to, to share yeah. with the audience. And I'll get to, to get to some questions. I'm getting the sign that we need to ask questions. So, Yeah, you know, there's, you know, we talked a lot about trust within the government over across the partners. Um, you have to do it across the supply chain. We innovate pretty heavily across the supply chain. Uh, and. Um, you, you, there's multiple constituencies that we have to make work. When the, the first one that we have to make work is our own companies. And right. one of the things I was sitting, you mentioned John Chambers earlier, I was actually sitting in a meeting and with about 15 very large company CEOs and, the, and how he opened it is, uh, his opening comment was, you know, in five years, 40% of you won't be here. Because mm -hmm. everybody's seen the statistics about the S&P 500 and how long you last. and. It was a very, you know, kind of a striking thing because everybody was talking about their problems. And some guys were talking about India, some guys talking about China, um, somebody's talking about the commodities falling apart. And I, and I just said, I actually think the problem we have to solve first is with our companies. 
Right. And the key thing about our companies is, is we have to build a culture of agility because you don't know what's going to happen in five and ten years. You know, Apple came out with the iPhone just in 2007. 2007. Yeah, you know, sure. you know, I think Oracle went on record in 2009 saying the cloud isn't even a real thing. And, mm -hmm. you know, you have all these disruptions that have occurred and you're not going to and, and they're accelerating. Right. So the most important thing I said that we need to do in our companies is build a culture of agility, which means we need to be able to recognize change and we need to pivot. And our company, when we say turn left, the company needs to turn left. And that goes all the way down to the to all the people. And I think that's a hugely important part of this transformation that we're going to have to go under because companies are going to have to figure out how to use their, you know, live in their existing model because it generates lots of free cash flow and it's got assets in the ground and it, it works and it's generating revenues and you don't, you don't want to get rid of that. But you also have to embrace you know, new ideas and new challenges. Right. You know, thinking, I'm thinking about you know, General Motors that right. recently, you know, he, they're not going to give up selling regular cars, but they just did an investment in Lyft of about $500 million. So, they, so I think new companies today have to get their own com company first built on trust within the company and that when we need to say go left, it actually goes left and we don't end up with all this bureaucracy and like, you know, roadblocks about, eh, that's not how we do it here. So I, right. I think that's a hugely important um, requirement of any CEO and what he needs to drive in his company um, as we move forward into this new digital economy. Message to the CEO so you're here five years from now. TK, you have, want to pick up on that? Yeah, I just want to pick up on that one. Because, Mike, how do you, uh, how do you go and convince a person in middle management whose entire life has been one of maintain <coughs> stability and you keep your job to now saying embrace you know, change and guess what? You may not have a job. Because that's the dilemma if you really look at it. And that's what a lot of middle management today is kind of fighting. So it's kind of interesting. When I look at large organizations, you'll find enormous congruence at the top, enormous congruence at the bottom, the layer in the middle. How do you handle that? Well, I think, it, I think it's a great, a great question. That's the challenge. You know, that was the challenge I put forward, is that that's what we need to build. You know, I think in running any company, you start with culture. You know, culture to me is that bridge between yeah. strategy and execution. That's and it. you can have brilliant strategy if you can't execute, it doesn't matter. Culture is the bridge. Culture is when is how we all row the boat in the same direction to get get to execution. And I think it needs to be built into the company, and I think it has to be in its core. What what we've done at Flex is we've tried to build that into our company from the very beginning. We're a little bit fortunate um, because. We never know what product we're going to build next, and we don't know which right. place it's going. So we're we're used flexible. to just taking the hill, no yeah. matter what. Yeah. It doesn't matter which industry, which location, or anything else. So we're fortunate, and we built a very strong culture built around agility. And but a lot of times, if you don't have a reason to change, if if the middle management doesn't recognize that change is needed, that's the first step in a change management process: yep. is the recognition of that you need to change then they won't get it. And I think that's the communication that you really need to drive into middle management. Because I actually agree with you. I actually think the middle is the biggest problem. Because yep. you can get the no execs question. on board. No question. But people have to feel the need to change. And that just comes with leadership and communication. All right. I, I, we, I've got, I, I've, I want to do a follow-up on that. But I'm going to ask, I think I have to take a question or two. Uh, so yes, Jonathan, we have a question here in the front. Thanks very much, uh, Robert. I suspect we're all looking forward to internet-enabled devices, not just being in the supply chain and the enterprise, but being in the home and being uh, suffusing the consumer environment. They're going to be in our bedrooms, in our kitchens. They're going to be around our wrists. And I wonder, before we invite them in so ubiquitously, if we shouldn't dwell for a moment on some of the principles by which they should behave, because they're going to be hewing to what far away servers tell them to. And an example might be, shouldn't we have the right to know the telemetry that they're sending back all the time uh, about us? Maybe even to own that data as consumers. Uh, so that when my Samsung TV or my Amazon Echo is listening all the time, just in case I want to change the channel, yeah. it's not catching everything else. Or shouldn't they have to be at least minimally interoperable? So when I buy one Philips light bulb, it doesn't mean my entire house had better go Philips or it's all over. It's like having a refrigerator that by design would only keep Pepsi cold but not Coke yeah. because of <laughs> yeah. the relationship. So, so if you or, think about or, it. Or, or just shouldn't it have Faraday mode? In other words, shouldn't it be able to work without internet so that if my toaster 
I just wanted to make toast one morning instead of having a long-term relationship with a breakfast-oriented service provider. So yeah. my, my question, <laughs> and this is true, there are companies that are saying that they're licensing the products to you rather than you owning them. Right. So I guess my question is, how much would you all be willing to think about developing and subscribing to an Internet of Things Bill of Rights? A few basic ideas that you'll say you'll do, and if you don't, we can call you out on it so that before our houses get suffused, we yeah. can feel a little it's, more it's comfortable. It's an interesting set of questions. I think, you know, when you think about it, there's a privacy question. There is a question about security. And, you know, and, and you two I know in particular, and you and, and, you and some deal with numbers. Of, how, how have your customers uh, been wrestling with this? Are they wrestling with that? I mean, one of the questions that's come out of this whole forum here at Davos is, you know, what is our... You know, what is frankly, you know, our design point as to what this now looks like. Where are we heading to the, uh, in the right compass heading, or are we just getting, you know, directed along the way? But I'd love to hear examples and hear how people think about it and what your customers have thought about it. Well, you know, a good portion of our, of our business, especially our security business, is identity management, which is where a lot of this starts from. But I'd take it back to how, how we started the conversation, this concept of trust. If you are a service provider or you have a product and you are using data in an untrustful way, I just don't think all of us are gonna put up with it. And what happens there, we, we make it so complicated. There is a bill of rights or what it, whatever you wanna call it, but there is an agreement on who owns the data. Okay. I'd encourage everybody here, if you wanna just to find out how this works, just go turn the, you know, your, on your browser or on your, on your smartphone, turn the cookies off, and all these apps that you got for free, watch how many of them don't work anymore. Mm -hmm. You're not getting these apps for free. They're taking that data, they're amalgamating it, and they're selling it. And I think that there's a lot of frustration with respect to that because you're getting surprised all the time. Uh, we all know that you use Google Mail. They're very transparent. They say, we're gonna give you free mail. It's gonna be, it's gonna be safe and secure. You're the only one that's gonna read it, but we're gonna read it and we're gonna be sending you advertisements based on what your mail says. I think that that's, you know, if you like that, that's great, but I think Google's been very transparent about what that is. Mm -hmm. If you take a look at Facebook, you know, especially all these publicly traded companies that are in the social space, uh, they have to continue to grow. Just pay attention in the next one or two weeks how many more advertisements you're getting on your Facebook page or LinkedIn. Pay attention to how much more that's happening. It's not for free. You're trading your identity and the information about you for a service. And I think that that's been pretty wishy-washy uh, since the inception of a lot of the sharing economy, a lot of the social economy. And the thing that I think is being the catalyst for making a stop and pause and think about this is gonna be healthcare. Mm -hmm. Because that's exactly something right. that is very personal and healthcare is going to get that right. They're gonna make sure that you have your identity and your information. And when you think about it for healthcare, you're gonna start asking the question, what about my banking? What about my social media? What about my email? Maybe I'm willing to pay, you know, 15, 20, X number of dollars a month to have a private email server where it's just me and right. it's definitely secure. Right. So I think we're all learning this and that's the beauty of, you know, changing these. That's the beauty of a revolution, right? That's, we, that's we get exactly to learn it. it there's gonna be winners and there's gonna be losers and we're gonna, we're gonna try things along the way, much like Andreas told us to do. Some of them are gonna work, some of them aren't gonna work. This is one where I think everybody's getting pretty smart about. That's you right. know, I'd like to add just real quickly, I think Mike's, you know, spoke very articulately on this and I, and I think it's right. But one thing I can tell you is the digital economy, okay. The consumer runs it. Yeah. It's very different. The enterprise doesn't run it anymore. The enterprise yeah. doesn't say, here's your product, and I'm going to get you a new one next year, and this is what it's going to look like. The it's consumer the votes customer. Right. really quick. You look at you look at Airbnb, you look right. at Uber, and you can see how fast the, the consumer shifts. So what's good is, as they become educated, um, I actually think there's going to have to be um, more communication between what data is being captured and what isn't. Right. Otherwise, the consumer will vote real quick, and then we'll, then yeah. it'll switch. I don't know if you have any thoughts or interest. No. Just one thought here, which you know, if you look at the demographics, right. I think the demographics themselves today determine, determine what privacy should look like. Mm -hmm. If you go to the kids and you ask them about privacy, the answer is don't care. Right. Because they're looking for instant value. Now, as they mature, as they get older, I'm sure they'll come down to <laughs> come down to the whole issue of saying, you know, what maybe privacy is important. As a father, I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I think they'll get there. But today, that's not an issue for that demographic group that we're addressing. Yeah. But I think what's happened is that the value in an in, a, in the environment today, people who actually buy stuff, people who actually transact high-value stuff, 
are people sitting around this table, and for yeah. us, privacy is critical. Yeah, it's interesting to me. I know being in this business, and you know, my business, we run about a nine billion dollar portfolio of private equity or of software businesses, and we deal with this every day in policy around you know data and privacy, etc. The thing that's interesting in answering your question, I see very thoughtful leaders in this space now taking the lead and saying, listen, you know, regulation by definition comes in behind, it comes in arrear, but I see business leaders saying we have to be thoughtful about it, start to write policies, bill of rights type policies in terms of who's entitled to what at what time, et cetera. So I'm actually quite encouraged about you know, our industry in general, but we ought to make sure we also have our compass moving in the right direction. Let me see if we have time for another question. Yes, sir. I'm Yoshi Hori of Globus Japan. I heard a lot about technology and platform, ecosystem, culture, government, and security, and so forth. But what I have not heard is about education. And when, when there are so many things happening, and people in strategy, you need to change the skill set of, of the employees. So my question is, what kind of education are you doing inside your company? And what do you expect your uh, like universities to produce? What kind of skills and what kind of curriculum do you expect them to have? Great, great question. And you guys want to take that? So I can talk about our business. So you know, if you if you look at our business, the technology side, a couple of years ago, we used to be ten years ago, we used to train people who come out of college. They used to be trained on a certain set of programming languages, say. Now what we are finding is that that entire thing has to change. Mm -hmm. Every person who's got to be relevant in the space today has to have, number one, diff programming language and a whole bunch of them. Number two, they need to have algorithmic knowledge and algorithmic skills. And third and most important, they need to have database skills. In the past, there used to be three sets of individuals who had this. Now it's one. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, what's happened is that the way they cut the cycle times for deploying software projects have dramatically shrunk. Mm -hmm. So now it's so really, in a way, it's a perfect storm for every individual out there. And the funny thing is educational institutions do not produce these kind of people. Right. Right. So every time they come out, we have to literally retrain these guys. And it's a crying shame when you spend four years in college and you come out, we <laughs> again train them. It is. I, I'll speak to our portfolio just to give you a sense. You know, we have now probably 30,000 plus employees worldwide. Uh, I'm probably the only private equity firm I know that has three full-time trainers on staff that when we buy, acquire, or partner with a company, we bring that group in to now build training systems, six-month, nine-month boot camps to, in fact, infuse our population with these sorts of skills and others and then tune it depending upon what area within the organization they're working with. But again, the, the thing that I want to make sure we're all thoughtful of, which is, has been quite encouraging for me here at Davos is people are looking at this this fourth industrial revolution as an opportunity for inclusion, creating on-ramps for populations who didn't participate in the third revolution but have an opportunity to participate in the fourth. And I think we'd be missing a great opportunity if we don't do that. So I, you know, I've been encouraged by what I've seen, what I've heard uh, in the conferences, in the panels, and, and frankly, you know, walking along these, these cold, frigid seat, uh, uh, streets over the last couple of days. Let me ask, uh, do we have any other questions that, that, that we can take? Yes, sir. I just want to follow on the interoperability point that was raised. I mean, the software industry is notorious for bringing out multiple standards. And it's a good thing when you're trying to compete for a winning standard. But when you're trying to get all these devices connected, from a city manager's perspective, that is crazy. Interoperability standards, <laughs> anyone? We, we, we will screw it up. <laughs> a few times first. Guaranteed. Right? <laughs> and, and the reason for that is the beauty of standards is that there's so many to choose from. <laughs> and, the, and the people that build software, you know, our egos outpace our, our, our productivity. And we have to manage that, but I, I doubt that we will get that right. It'll be an evolutionary path, and over time, there will be a lot of different technologies that solve this problem. What, what, do you, what can you do today? Today, you use these things called APIs. And there's lots of companies that do this very well. We happen to be one of them. And what it does is just isolates all these, these standards um, so that you can get at the data that you want in a safe, secure fashion and then propagate that data to whatever platform that you want. But to think that Apple is going to give up its platform and not be difficult to deal with with Microsoft. I mean, that war has been going on for 45 years. Um, we take a look at just even Google Docs and trying to move Google Docs from three or four different browsers. Very, very difficult. And last 
I checked, we're in 2016. Right. This is a solvable problem. We choose not to solve it. Right. I'll give you a real, real hard example. We have this product called Wink, which is one of the almost leading home hub. Right. And what it does, it allows you to hook up your drop cam and your Nest and your Echo and your, you know, into a simple user interface. So there's no real standards for the home, so it has six radios in it. Oh, goodness. So think goodness about gracious. the inefficiency from a manufacturing wow. standpoint, but we get everything hooked up. <laughs> <laughs> you get the inefficiency of manufacturing six radios, you get the confusion in the consumer base, and also you get the confusion of the general electric light bulb when, they, you know, when those guys say, which system do I hook up to? So we actually solved it by six standards. The more we can get to a standard system, the, the more interoperability we're going to get, the faster we'll get adoption because it'll be easier to use, it'll be simpler for the consumer, and it'll be e faster on-ramp for the uh, manufacturers. But it's going to take a lot of time. Apple and Microsoft and Google are not going to just like... Give up. Andres, yeah. you're on, the, you're on <laughs> the front edge of this thing. Give us your thoughts on, on standards in, in your industry as it evolves. Um, because it's aerospace, uh, you know, um, how do we uh, figure out how we use the same airspace? I think the likelihood there is higher. Um, and there has been, there have been already been um, efforts, uh, you know, even, even though the, uh, the industry is at the very early stage, uh, we already try to come together and figure out how we're going to do it. So it's a very encouraging uh, image there. I, I saw a couple more questions, but we're out of time. So we'll be around if anyone has specific questions. I do want to uh, thank this wonderful and distinguished panel with, with, with one uh, observation. When people found out that our panel was coming together, the market seemed to rally. So uh, you know, we will keep that in mind for next year. But uh, thank you, Andreas and, and Mike and thank DK. You, Ryan. Thanks, Ryan.